our uh, speaker tonight uh, is speaking on the Bobbling Project, uh, a project for funding protection for those kinds of uh, grasslands. Uh, he's Associate Dean of the Rubenstein School of Environment at, and Natural Resources at UVM. Um, Alan Strong. Thanks a lot, Ron. Well, thank you. It's a great welcome. Let's see if we can get this rolling. Nice. All right. So, um, as uh, as Ron noted, my name is Alan Strong. I uh, I teach up at UVM at the Rubenstein School, and since uh, 2002. We've actually been working on this long-term research on grassland songbirds. We've been focusing primarily on two species, uh, the savanna sparrow and then the bobolink, which I'll be talking primarily about tonight. But it's been a really interesting project because there is this really sort of strong tie as well as <clears throat> um, this kind of you know, bit of antagonism between our agricultural industry in Vermont as, and these grassland birds ecology. So the only reason that we actually have these species in Vermont is because we've got a farming uh, community here. Um, Vermont historically originally was essentially 100% forested and when we opened the landscape up in the, in the 8th, 17, 1800s, um, these birds actually had, to some degree, a change in distribution from the Midwest to the eastern United States. And so now that, that legacy is really the reason why these birds are here. Um, but at the same time, there are some management conflicts in terms of when we conduct our farming activities and, and when these birds are nesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research we've been doing, how that ties into the, some of the conservation programs we've been doing, and then talk about this, this new program that we've uh, started up in Vermont in the last year or so. So a lot of... Uh, a lot of this work is, is done through a team. I didn't do all of this alone. So a lot of grants from the federal government, some from the school, some from uh, smaller organizations. And um, in particular, I've been working since 2002 with a uh, former grad student, then postdoc, and now colleague at the University of New England, Noah Perlett. And so a lot of this work is, uh, is information that we've been collecting together. And then the Bobolink project in particular is, um, is uh, a collaboration between UConn and uh, UVM and UVM Extension. So Stephen Swallow and Lisa Chase are some folks I've been working with. Um, <laughs> exactly. He claims to be an economist, but <laughs> you know the name like Swallow. So um, the, uh, and the other is, um, you know, one of the reasons why um, Thinking about grassland conservation, grassland bird conservation, is such a challenge. Is essentially all of the habitat is on private land, and so we've really been fortunate to work with some great landowners over the years, some really amazing people, and lots of people have let us come out and do point counts and ban birds and put radio transmitters on and take blood and you know all of the all of the things weird things that biologists do. But in essence, what we've really been sort of shooting for here is to try to come up with a way to basically, you know, sort of have our birds and have our cows as well. How are there ways that we can actually have uh, a functional, economically healthy dairy industry as well as have grassland birds in the landscape? And so <clears throat> this is really kind of the, the work that we've, been, that we've been looking at. So um, the... Uh, the, um, a lot of bird conservation groups have been thinking about ways to, you know, essentially implement more continental range um, management um, strategies. And one of the things they do is they break the, break the country into these smaller regions. And so the Champlain Valley ends up falling in this, what they call bird conservation region that includes the St. Lawrence around Lake Ontario, around Lake Erie, the Mohawk uh, Hudson Valley of New York. And so it's, you know, in some ways it's part of a larger area in which people are thinking about grassland bird conservation. 
But Vermont, in and of itself, is a really important area for a lot of these grassland bird species. And so this is some work that we did a number of years ago where we actually tried to quantify how many, you know, how many grassland parcels there are in the Champlain Valley. Does anyone guess how many black dots there are in that? <laughs> yeah. The number is actually 32,000. Um, but most of them are really small. I mean, there are lots and lots of small patches, not that many big ones. But if you aggregate that, um, it's 60, 70,000 acres of, of grassland in the Champlain Valley. So there's a lot of habitat. Um, and it obviously provides the you know, important nesting area for birds like this, the meadowlark and the, and the bobolink. And so the, you know, the reason for the concern, as, um, as many of you know, is that these birds are showing these long-term population declines. Um, birds are so visible and so vocal, they're really easy to keep track of. Um, they're easy to count, they're easy to census, and so we've got some really good data. Some of you may be involved with this program called the Breeding Birds Survey, in which roadside counts are conducted all across North America. And we get these indices of population change. And so these numbers, um, maybe it's hard to read in the back, but most of them range in the 3 to 4 to up to 10% per year declines. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but some of you may have heard the statistic for the bobolink where the population decline has been about 75% in the last 40 years. We've basically got 40 years of data that can show that 3%, 3.6% per year over 40 years leads to this massive decline in the overall population. But most of these species, um, our populations are declining. And now we've got good populations still of bobolinks and savanna sparrows. Metal larks, a little less common, but still here. Grasshopper sparrows, as many of you know, are, uh, are threatened species in Vermont. Upland sandpipers are endangered. Sedge wrens are endangered. And then Henslow sparrows, I'm technically listed as endangered, but actually extirpated from Vermont. We have not had any in the last 25 or 30 years in the state um, recorded at all. So um, in the Northeast, we've got really two things going on with these birds. One is the fact that um, we've, we're seeing a decline in the agricultural industry. So we've got fewer farms. A lot of the, that farmland is succeeding into forest. So there's just not enough habitat. And then on the remaining habitat, the remaining grasslands that are out there, they're being managed more intensively. So we've got earlier and more frequent cutting um, on those, as well as row crops. So these are just some statistics from Vermont. The USDA is pretty good about kind of keeping track of, um, keeping track of the number of farms, the acreage of hay. You can see these really steep declines over the last 50 years. 70% decrease in number of farms, 74% decrease in acreage of uh, harvested hay. Does it sound like any other number that I just mentioned? 75% decline in the bobolink over the last 40 years. Um, so this is, this is kind of interesting too. The number of cows has not decreased as much. So you get the idea this, this means that the, the farm size is increasing as well. So we haven't lost cows at the same rate. But what's the, what's the number of dairy farms now in Vermont? It's less than 900, I think, something like that. So it uh, continues to decline. And so we, um, a number of years ago, we actually... Um, surveyed farmers to find out a little bit more about their cutting practices and trying to understand how that's changed over time. And as you can see here, we asked them, relative to today, um, are you cutting earlier than you did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago? And so these are the answers, these numbers here are the percentages of farmers. So. 54% of farmers are cutting earlier than they did 10 years ago, then 64 and 72% cutting earlier than they did 30 years ago. And this is, these numbers are very similar. So the percentage of farmers that are cutting hay more often than they did 10, 20, or 30 years ago, and they're, they're almost identical. So more frequent cuts and earlier cuts. 
And that leads to this conflict in terms of thinking about the, um, the overlap between activities on the hay fields and the, the breeding cycle of bobolinks. And so this, <clears throat> in a lot of ways, is uh, the research we've done is really simple. Um, we go out, we set up mist nets in the fields, we catch the birds in these nets, we put bands on them, color bands for the most part, so we can actually recognize who's who just by using binoculars. Um, we follow them around the fields until we find their nests, and then we see how many eggs they laid and how many young they fledge. And, um, you know, it's kind of old-fashioned biology. You just kind of need a, a field notebook and a pencil and a pair of binoculars, and you can get your information. So we were really interested in the kind of a, a, a range of, of management strategies and how those different management activities um, have influenced these birds um, over the years, and primarily their reproducti reproduction. And so we basically looked at timing of cutting. I mean, that was primary, primarily the thing we looked, about, looked at. And so here is kind of the standard um, cut for, for most dairy farmers, an early cut. You know, people are shooting for Memorial Day weekend, then, you know, sort of a five to six week rotation after that before the second cut. Um, here, in this case, um, what we call a middle cut is fields that were cut, I don't know, mid-June to, to mid-July, somewhere in that range. And a lot of this is um, maybe for, for beef cattle, for horses, um, typically not that early cut in which the farmers are really trying to get that high protein forage. And then late cut, um, in essence, these are, you know, we, we often think of this as kind of the, the gentleman farmers where, um, you know, in some cases it may just be a field that's too wet to get on until later in the, in the breeding season or later in the growing season. But in many cases, these are landowners that, you know, don't necessarily need that hay for anything. They're, they're cutting it, they like the view, they like the openness, but they're not necessarily using this for any sort of commercial purpose, maybe sometimes for bedding or for mulch or something like that. And then I'm not going to talk about it too much, but we also looked at, uh, at rotational grazing. So we were also kind of thinking about what happens when you've got animals out in the field at the same time the birds are nesting. So those are the, what you'll see, you know, the, the one, one of, I don't know, maybe there's three different data slides. Maybe there's four. You've got to have graphs, right? Um, and, um, and so I'll, I'll, it'll be kind of organized like this around those different treatments. So this is just, um, you know, sort of a, a little bit of a cartoon that just kind of shows the, the breeding cycle of birds relative to the, to the cutting cycle. And so we've got, um, we've got two different species that we really were studying, savanna sparrows and bobolinks. Savanna sparrows are a species that, um, that winters primarily in the United States. Maybe some go down to Mexico and Central America, but most of the, uh, the population that breeds in the Northeast winters in the Southeastern United States. So they're not a long distance migrant. They're in, the, you know, they're in the sort of temperate zone for the entire year. So they actually return to the breeding grounds earlier than bobolinks do. So we'll actually have our first birds coming back in, in uh, mid-April, but this ARR stands for arrival. So kind of peak arrival of savanna sparrows is in the, at the end of April. Init, nest initiation. So most of the nest initiation that we're seeing in savanna sparrows happens in the middle of May. And then fledging is occurring out here in, uh, you know, sort of the peak is out here in the, the first uh, couple weeks of June. Bobolinks, on the other hand, are much, uh, much longer distance migrants. People know where, where bobolinks winter? You heard Roz Renfrew speak on this topic at all? So yeah, right, so they're a long distance migrant. They winter in South America. So Argentina, Bolivia, Southern Brazil, Uruguay. So they are, they are going a long way and takes them a lot longer to get here than if you were wintering in, in North Carolina. And so, um, so their arrival is more like mid-May initiating nests toward the end of May, and we're really not seeing much in the way of fledging for the most part until later in June, and I'll show you some more detailed data on this a little bit later. 
But as you can see then, if you sort of overlay that Memorial Day cut on top of this, you're only going to have the very earliest of the early savanna sparrows that are going to be successfully fledging young, and no bobolinks would be able to fledge young. And if you put on top of that now a five-week cutting period, there's just not a to enough time to kind of take these two and squeeze them into this five-week period. So there's just not enough time for these birds to successfully breed in that, in that short five to six week window. So we were really interested in trying to, trying to understand this. Are there compromises? Are there way around it? What does this mean in terms of the reproductive ecology of these birds? We, um, we, we started with really trying to kind of better understand farming practices. And so we actually drove you know, like all over the Champlain Valley, and we were surveying fields, just looking at the timing of cutting and when farmers were, were out there cutting their fields. And so each of these lines is a different year. And so what you see is the sort of proportion of our sampling area that was hayed versus date. So this goes from, you know, basically Memorial Day weekend out to mid-July. So you've got a year like this, where there's not a heck of a lot being cut. And then you've got a year like this, where it's really being cut at a really rapid rate. Difference between these two is probably due to, exactly. So got a nice dry summer here. You got a soggy summer here, like last summer. And so in between is, you know, sort of all the vagaries of our, you know, our in our weather in, uh, weather in Vermont. But what we could do is sort of take those lines, the slow cutting year, the fast cutting year, and put them on a graph on top of bobolink um, nesting uh, phenology. When do they actually fledge young? So this is, the, this is the soggy wet year. This is the dry year when a lot of the Champlain Valley is being cut. You can see there's a heck of a lot of difference here. Um, so at, you know, sort of any given time, the percentage of the Champlain Valley being cut by date is, you know, sort of somewhere in this area. But then if we put on top of this the bobolink fledging period, so this, these numbers represent on any given date the proportion of all the nests that we've monitored um, what proportion have actually you have had young leave the nest? And so we're, get, we're down here, and most of this work we've been doing in Hinesburg, Charlotte, Shelburne, so it's a little bit further north of here. But no nest, no fledging until about the 14th of June, at which point we start to see this, um, this increase. And you can see it's really fast during these you know, sort of three week period from the 14th of June till maybe about the 10th of July, lots and lots of bobolinks are fledging young at that point. But you can also see that by the date we have the first bobolink fledging, at a minimum, a little over 20% of the Champlain Valley has been cut. And, oops, I see, I'm going backwards or at a maximum here, maybe 55%. And so at the time that these birds are first fledging, we've already sort of lost a big chunk of the available habitat. Um, what's interesting though, and maybe I'll, I'm trying to think if I want to come back and explain that. Um, maybe I'll come back to that slide in a minute. So, so essentially what this means is that depending upon how the field is managed, there's real strong differences in terms of the reproductive success of these birds. And so for each of these two, maybe I'll, I'll read these off if you can't see it in the back. So these again are those four different management treatments, early hade, grazed, middle hade, and late hade. And the blue line, blue bars are bobolinks, the red lines are red bars are savanna sparrows. So in these early hay fields, we essentially have no reproductive success of bobolinks, and it steadily increases as we go from grays to middle hay to late hay. 
for savanna sparrows, um, you do actually get some reproductive success in these early hade fields, more in grazed, and then between middle and late hade, not a heck of a lot of difference. The birds are actually doing pretty well in both of those, uh, both of those types of management um, ec um, strategies. So, oops, got my, uh, so the, the interesting aspect of this is, is why, why do savanna sparrows actually do so well in these early cut fields and bobolinks don't do well at all? Um, and the difference has to do with how these birds react to cutting. And so savanna sparrows are um, unbelievably resilient. These are just sort of like the energizer bunnies of the bird world. And they just kind of keep coming back and back and going and going and going. Field is cut, we'll try again. Field is cut, we'll try again. And we've actually had birds, um, we've had birds lay eggs, start to lay eggs two days after a field is cut on a nest that literally is like a meter away from where their last nest was. Um, it's just like, boom, they're right back at it. Um, and so eventually, they get a period that's long enough, you know, whether it's you know, by, by rain or by design of the farmer, they get a period that's long enough where they can successfully raise some young. Bobolinks, on the other hand, um, typically just take off. I mean, for bobolinks, um, it's, it's almost like they're thinking about, you know, they're, you know, they've come from South America, they're now here in North America, and it's like, woohoo, I can go anywhere. So they, they, just, they just leave these fields. We've got incredible turnover after the first cut. We'll have some birds coming back, but it's not the same birds that were actually there prior to the field being cut. Um, but they don't come back immediately. And so that puts bobolinks again at a disadvantage. It seems like it takes seven to 10 days after a cut for the grass to grow high enough again for them to actually say, oh, okay, now there's enough cover for me to nest there. So that difference in terms of the way these birds respond to the cutting is really important in terms of thinking about, you know, how do we actually, you know, sort of think about different strategies for these, um, for these birds. And yeah, what I'll, what I'll actually, maybe I'll go, go back and just mention one thing here. So remember, most of these birds um, are fledging in this three-week period. This is, this is kind of that um, pulse of all these birds coming back from South America roughly at the same time, and that's kind of this burst of reproductive activity. But remember, there's a whole population of bobolinks that after Memorial Day weekend are now floating around the Northeast looking for a place to re-nest. And that's this kind of straggler population out here. So these are birds that were displaced once and have decided, oh, okay, I'm going to re-nest here. And that's, that's what this slow part of the curve is about, um, re-nesting birds from, that have displaced from some other, some other field somewhere nearby. We don't know exactly where. So as a lot of you know, in the, um, the mid-1980s, um, the USDA and the Natural Resources Conservation Service started to think a little bit differently about the way that they um, essentially, you know, sort of subsidize agriculture. And they started to put a lot more emphasis on environmental quality. And so the big program that was really effective for, um, you know, ducks and prairie nesting birds in the Midwest was the Conservation Reserve Program. And they essentially took, you know, literally millions of acres out of production. That particular program hasn't been um, as widespread here in Vermont, but there are other programs that our state and our CS has, has been able to you know, sort of sell as having some value to farmers. One of them that we kind of took a look at and you know, scratched our heads and said, hmm, maybe, there's, maybe there's some possibilities here, is this environmental quality incentive program. And so the idea here is this, you know, sort of this clause at the end, agricultural production and environmental quality are compatible national goals. And so we started thinking, you know, are there some ways to actually, you know, sort of incentivize farmers to do things slightly differently such that we actually could have both, you know, forage production as well as bobolink production. <clears throat> and so 
This was, and, and you have to kind of keep this in mind because this is sort of one of the, one of the little twists of the story here, um, but I won't say the word just yet. The NRCS Grassland Bird Conservation Program was something that we started kind of thinking about and said, hey, let's take this to NRCS and see if they're interested in, in trying to run with this, trying to make this a program that would be available to farmers. And so the, the biggie here is to say, we know that it's really important for farmers to get that early first cut that's got the highest quality forage, the highest protein content, and we know that they can't sacrifice that, that that's just too important to milking operations. But we also want to say, is there you know, sort of a, another possibility here in terms of thinking about how do we, how do we actually get bobolinks to successfully breed here? And so the, the, the way we went about it is thinking about delaying the second cut. So let's leave the first cut alone and let's actually delay that second cut and put enough time between the first and second cut that those birds can come back and successfully nest. So the key though that we found and we, were, we had monitored enough fields to know that the later the first cut, the less likely that bobolinks are going to come back. And so we, we, we noticed that when you get to about the 9th or the 10th of June, if that's your first cut, the probability of bobolinks settling on that field again is almost zero. There's still enough time for them, but they've, they've kind of made their decisions by that time of the year. And we had, the earlier we went, the better, the better likelihood that birds would re-nest. So we put this stipulation in that the first cut had to be prior to the 31st of May. First of June, we've used, you know, sort of those two days in here. Then this delayed second cut for 65 days. And the payment, <coughs> and, and the, the nice thing about this, NR, this old NRCS program, is what they were actually to, they were able to pay farmers for what they call foregone income. So in essence, what did you lose by having to delay that second cut? You got more forage, but it's not as good. So what's the, what did you lose there? And the price they came up with was $135 an acre in the, in the lost quality of that forage. So there was a minimum of 20 acres. It had to be mostly grass, had to be relatively square or circular, so there's not a lot of edge. And basically they said, what we'd like you to do is to sort of adopt this long term. So we want you to do it for five years, but we're only going to pay you for three years. So the idea is you sort of get, you know, um, you know slowly kind of broken into this idea of, you know, this will work for you. So um, what ended up happening is we didn't get much um, interest in this the first year of the program, but over you know, the next few years, it actually took off fairly well. And we ended up with, um, I think, over 1,000 acres enrolled in this program um, by the time of the peak. But, um, and I guess I should say, say um, oh, well, we, we have math here. You guys ready? <laughs> <laughs> the high, high-powered math. No integrals or derivatives, but so I just wanted to kind of tell you how we came up with 65 days. So roughly two weeks for the grass to regrow. Um, takes these birds about five days to build a nest. They can do it faster like the savanna sparrow I mentioned. Incubation period is 11 days. Nestling period is 11 days. About, once they get out of the nest, the thing we don't really know that much about is how long it actually takes them to be able to fly well enough to get away from a tractor. I mean, it's, we, we just don't really know the answer to that. So we said 14 days, but we also wanted to take into account that, you know, there could be errors in this. We're not exactly sure about some of these numbers. So we have this sort of 10 days, we call measurement error. And there's our, sort of where the 65 days comes from. So. Hopefully those numbers add up. You can, you can do them. You can probably do them in your head faster than I can. So, um, <clears throat> But the thing I wanted to point out is we actually did monitor this for, for quite a number of years to look at, you know, does it work? Obviously, we're putting money into this program. You'd want to have some suggestion that it's actually, you know, that it's actually working. And so it's, a l again, a little bit, um, you know, a, a, a little graphy here, but we've got um, the blue bars are the number of eggs or the clutch size that these birds laid. 
and we've got essentially sort of a comparison of this program, so the one I just mentioned, this delayed second cut, to what we found for bobbling, sort of the best of the best. You just wait until the breeding season is over before you cut. So that's this you know, late cut or cut after the first of August, or this early cut. So this is when you know, sort of a traditional uh, Memorial Day cut and then five week increments from, from uh, one cut to the next, five to six weeks. <clears throat> so clutch size doesn't vary a lot. They lay roughly the same number of eggs. Um, a little bit fewer here, probably because a lot of the nests are actually destroyed before the clutch is complete. And fewer here because we've actually lost their first nest. I mean, it, they, we actually have kind of said by this program, we're sort of sacrificing that first nest. So the birds probably don't have quite as much, um, you know, sort of energetic reserves to, to lay the next clutch. So highest clutch size is here. But the thing that's important is this, the number of offspring produced. So basically zero here, um, and then roughly around three young produced per nest in both of these, cut after the first of August or delayed second cut. So seems to work pretty well. We're having relatively similar reproductive output by these bobolinks, which is, which is really great. <coughs> so, before I, before I show that slide, I guess the, I got to go back to that word old. And, uh, and what ended up happening with that NRCS program is they said, um, you know, great, we're really happy it's working in Vermont, but, you know, too much of a good thing. You guys can't have that. So um, they, they did not want to pay for that foregone income. For some reason, the economic side of econo economists at USDA didn't like that. Foregone income wasn't something they wanted to pay for, so they dropped the price radically. It's now, I think, in the 80-some-odd dollars an acre um, is what they're paying now. And since they dropped the price, we've had no one sign up. So 1,000 acres and now, now none. So, um, so it was great while it lasted, but it, it's not lasting anymore. So. So we've sort of, we've taken this kind of new approach and what I wanted to, you know, talk to you or sort of introduce to you today is this sort of alternative way of thinking about providing habitat for bobolinks. And we've taken this, um, this approach of thinking about what we call ecosystem services. And so in, you know, sort of in the broadest sense of things, there are these, um, y you know, these, these services that nature provides to us for free. We do not have to pay for them. We do not have to pay for oxygen. We do not have to pay for you know, climate regulation. We don't have to pay for um, flood protection in wetlands. So there are these services out there that you know, we kind of take for granted. And the question is, are there, are there some of these that we might actually pay for? Um, and so, you know, they, they often break these up into a bunch of different types of services, regulation services, provisioning services. So, you know, these are the things that provide, you know, food or fuel or fiber, things that, you know, we sort of need on a daily basis. And you might have to pay for some of these. Um, information services, kind of a fancy name for aesthetics or cultural values or recreation. But they've got this supporting services down here. And obviously most people realize how important the, you know, sort of life around us is from, a, uh, how, much, how important biodiversity is to supporting life around us, you know, pollinators and seed dispersers and, and obviously, you know, production of oxygen and sequestration of carbon dioxide, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So these supporting services, habitat in particular, is the one we thought, well, is it possible that, that people would actually pay for this? Is there a way that people might say, this is a, this is a good that I value, it's a service that I value, would I, would I think about paying for it? And so um, what we kind of set forward is to say, you know, there's a potential service out here that farmers are providing. They're providing, they're providing habitat for these grassland birds. It's just not necessarily high quality habitat right now because it's getting getting cut when these birds are nesting. So could we actually say, you know, there's an audience out here that actually values this bird habitat 
and would they pay the farmers to do something different to provide that habitat? And so we were asking this question, essentially sort of as this, you know, kind of a research grant, is there sufficient interest in bobbling conservation that the public might pay landowners or farmers to initiate these bird-friendly management practices? And so these were the results from 2013. So we actually ended up raising about $31,000 to pay to farmers to change their management practices on 200 acres. And we actually gave farmers the choice. They could either just wait until the 1st of August, or if they wanted, they, they could do this 65-day delay, everything done by the 1st of June, and then wait 65 days. And so we ended up having seven landowners involved in the project, and they pledged anywhere from, I think we had one that um, put 70 acres in, we had a few that put 10 acres in. And so this was, the, this was kind of the results from 2013. And so we're at it again this year. And, um, and over here on the table, <laughs> we, have the, uh, we have the pledge forms. And so if you're interested in this, you're, you're welcome to contribute. So it's sort of an interesting aspect to, to kind of think about is, um, you know, we often rely on you know, state and federal governments to do a lot of the sort of, you know, kind of the heavy lifting in terms of conservation work to you know, buy the habitat for endangered species, buy the wildlife management areas, do the, do the management. But you know, if you think about it, um, well, if you think about it, the 70% 70, 70 of the United States is is held by private landowners. I mean, most of the land in the, you know, especially in the lower 48 is in private land. And so that's where the wildlife is. And so thinking about how do we, you know, sort of encourage our neighbors and, you know, our, you know, our, our friends to, to think about, you know, there's opportunities here. Um, opportunities perhaps even, you know, in your own backyard. So the idea really is to say, can we make these connections? Because you know, everybody knows that you know, dairy farmers are having a rough time in Vermont. Is this also a way to preserve our agricultural heritage at the same time we're providing this good for, uh, for grassland bird habitat? So there's, as I mentioned, there's pledge forms here. There's also, um, we have this website, very easy to find, www.bobblingproject.com. You can learn more about the project up here. We've got testimonials. Our own Elizabeth Frank is, uh, is up here and uh, featured in one of the videos. She enrolled in the, in the program last year. Um, but uh, some also some, you know, some sort of nice resources in terms of grassland bird management up there, if that's something that you're interested in. So uh, with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the project, about grassland birds. Um, and, uh, Feel free to, to let them go. Gary, how are you? Yeah, I'm just a, a little bit of uh, off of it. Could you just spend like a minute or two and just talk about your bird program in Indiana? Because that's another thing. Yeah. Really yeah, yeah. So we, um, we again, we, we started this work in 2002. And um, the graphs that show the information about when bobolinks are fledging or how well they're doing in this habitat, that habitat was work that we'd been conducting with you know, literally kind of an army of field assistants and graduate students and again been going for over 10 years now. Um, there's been some, you know, I've, I've sort of stuck to kind of the nuts and bolts here, but there's been some really interesting offshoots of that research as well that, um, that are kind of fascinating. Um, a mystery of songbirds is, I mean, well, there's a, there's a bunch of mysteries, but one is how well do birds survive after they fledge from the nest? So we, you know, I showed you those numbers about how many young fledge out of, out of each nest. Um, but we have no idea after that, do they live or do they die? Um, you think that's probably a really dangerous time in a bird's, young bird's life. They're becoming independent from their parents. They're just learning how to fly. And so we've actually found lots of our birds come back to the, the Champlain Valley. I mean, we have to sometimes go you know, a few kilometers to find them, but we're actually getting to the point where we can estimate first year survival of these birds. Um, 
Nobody's really cracked that nut, so it's really been kind of interesting. Um, I mentioned Rosalind Renfrew, who we've been collaborating with, and we've been putting these geolocators on, uh, on birds, and so we actually um, collect data on the location of these birds throughout their annual cycle. And the birds have come back. We've taken the, the geolocator off. Unfortunately, this doesn't actually broadcast. You can't follow a migrating bobolink on your computer. Um, you know, it'll come, but it hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. Um, but when you catch these birds, you can actually download this information. And we're finding some really interesting stuff. One is that co the continental, so bobolinks actually breed all the way from Vermont to Oregon in North America. M the Oregon, uh, Oregon population is kind of disjunct. But we're actually finding once they get to South America, they're just mixed. Um, they're, they're all in the same, you know, all in the same groups. Um, so, and they also have kind of a, some sub-wintering areas. So these birds actually stop in Venezuela. They're there for maybe a month. Then they go further south. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right now, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, so they, they're, you know, when we think about the wintering period for these birds, it's, it's actually sort of this, they're just on the move all the time, probably taking advantage of different resources over that period. Um, and so the other one that's been really fascinating about this, and uh, for a long time I spent my, my career studying forest birds, what a dunce, dunce I was, um, <laughs> because, you know, well, when a, when a forest bird's nest fails, they'll typically just move, you know, 50 yards, 25 yards, they'll build another nest. Bobolinks were the ones we were really curious about because we have this population turnover. So we actually put radio transmitters on these birds just before the field was getting cut. And we assumed they would just move one field over, maybe two fields over. They're just gone. We, you know, we put antennas in our trucks and started driving around, couldn't find any of them. We had to, we had to buy airplane time to find these birds. And they're going five miles and 10 miles. And unfortunately, they're actually making bad choices again. A lot of these birds will, they'll, they'll get cut here, they'll go to another field, and that field gets cut a week later, and then, you know, by then the nesting season is over. So, but they're traveling a long way. We found birds from Shelburne in um, middle Addison County. I guess we found one um, on, uh, on Nortontown Road. Um, and that bird was only there for a few days. They were actually cutting hay on the day that we found it, so it might have actually started another nest. We found them as far north as North Hero, and then that bird was gone. It was, it was in North Hero for a couple days and then vanished. So um, th they're, they're migrants, they're nomads, they're doing all kinds of uh, crazy stuff. So it's been, it's been interesting to sort of learn all these other aspects of the species' life history. Yeah. You know, they've got a lot of cows and they yep. gotta get they gotta get all the hay that yeah. they can get in yeah. possible. So Yeah, so that's a it's a great question. And the and the way we've arranged this and um this is this is where get, you know working with an economist becomes sometimes a little bit challenging because I'll 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 admit I'm not sure I necessarily understand all of this, but Basically, what we do is we actually we act we put that question to farmers. Actually, we ask them the question, "What would it take for you to put this into your you know basically your farm management plan?" And you can think about that however you want. We've we've asked farmers to say sort of like, "What's your drop dead price? If you don't get this, you know it's it's not going to be worth it for me." And you you could think about that in terms of, do you have to buy grain? Do you have to lease some other land? Um, is this going to make the, the hay crop worse next year because you're going to get, um, you know, weeds in there, you know, whatever it could be. So we're asking farmers to actually say, what, what, would, it, what would it cost you? And then what we do is the, the, the way it works is we take all the money that we, that we get and we actually order those bids from low to high. So you know, somebody, somebody bids, 
you know, $50 an acre, somebody 75, somebody 100, somebody 200, something like that. And we see how far the money can go. And, but the, the sort of weird thing about it, I guess, in terms of, you know, again, not exactly sure how the economist thinks about this, but then we pay everybody that, that lowest high price, basically. So if, if, the, if the last one that got in was $150 an acre, everybody gets paid $150 an acre. So that's, um, that's the experiment for now. One of the things that were, yeah, go ahead. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's actually a mix, right, yeah, it's kind of a mix of landowners right now, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, one of the things we've talked about is, and, and again, maybe there's some economists who can explain this to me, but um, I think they called it uh, hazard, the hazard function or something like that, I can't, rem I can't remember exactly, but, you know, you could think about, well, did, what did we lose by taking somebody who said they would do it for $50 an acre and paid them $150 an acre? One of the things that we're sort of grappling with is right now this project is, it's, it's essentially sponsored by a federal grant. So there's absolutely zero overhead. Every penny that comes in goes directly to the landowners. Um, but if we were to say, you know, hey, Ron, how'd you like to take this on for, for Otter Creek Audubon? Somebody's, somebody's got to somebody's have a salary to go talk to farmers and send out mailings and maintain a website, et cetera, et cetera. So we might say maybe there's a different, you know, maybe there's a different pricing structure if we, you know, sort of exported this to a, to a nonprofit or something like that. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering if, you, if there's things you're looking for in habitat. Yeah. Yep. Or do they do any hedgerow yeah, so else? yeah, good uh, yeah, good question. So only in the grass, and I should have I had a I had a picture I should have uh, I should have brought out here. Um, and and only in the center of grasslands as well. So typically there's a thirty to fifty yard kind of buffer around the edge where those birds won't nest. It's really amazing to we've we've used some, some mapping programs and we've plopped all the nest locations over the years on an aerial photo and it kind of looks like a donut. There's a ring around the edge where there are no nests and everybody's, you know, everybody's out in the center. So, but only, and, and generally when you need bigger, fields. need bigger fields and typically only when you've got, um, you know, primarily grass. They'll, they'll, they'll take some alfalfa, they'll take some other, you know, forbs or weeds, but, but grasses, not no weeds, not no weeds, yeah, 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 but, you know, some, and then, um, and they nest on the ground, I mean, right on the ground, so, yeah, yep, yep. How about the links doing in, oh, say, the Dakotas or, or They're doing bad everywhere. There is no, there is no good place to be a bobolink, except maybe, you know, when it's winter in Vermont. And then maybe it's not so bad to be a bobolink in South America, but no, the populations are yeah, yeah. So they they don't they don't breed. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So so they're the biggest issue. And again, if any of you've heard Roz Renfrew speak about this, is she did quite um, some extensive research there. One of the issues that bobolinks face, and uh, um, if you if you have heard their scientific name before, the genus is Dolichonyx, but the um, the, the species name is Orizivorus, um, which means rice eater, and so that puts them sort of in conflict with farmers in South America, and um, and so they actually um, are thought of as a pest species in South America. So couple things that are going on. The, the pampas grasslands in southern South America are getting converted to more ranching and more row crops. And in some of those row crops where they're planting rice, they're attracting bobolinks and bobolinks are getting, you know, I mean, they, they actually shoot, supposedly shoot at them. They don't aim to kill, but they're trying to scare them out of the rice field. So sure. it's not, yeah, exactly. It's not, a, it's not a picnic there either. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's a tricky question to answer, and so these these um, these species, like a lot of 
you know, sort of more specialized birds are what we call area sensitive. And so um, a bobolink territory is actually, um, you know, m maybe half an acre or something like that. It's not actually very big, but that term area sensitive means they need much bigger areas than just a single bird's home range. Now the complicating thing about it is they need more space when that field is isolated. So if you, you know, put a 10 acre field, you know, you put a little clear cut in Green Mountain National Forest and planted beautiful grass, um, you would probably not have any bobolinks there. But 10 acres in the Champlain Valley will easily find you a bobolink. So the NRCS, we were, we were a little bit concerned about how how many farmers we were going to enroll in this program. The, the old NRCS program, the minimum was 20 acres. We've actually dropped it to 10 acres um, with the sort of caveat that I need to look at it and see that there's suitable habitat around there to, a, to basically make bobolink things. So this is a, a good place to nest. So, um, so the, the, the real answer to that question is, you know, we don't actually know, um, but Smaller is fine if it's in a larger agricultural landscape. Does their food supply have something to do with where they nest? The fact that they're in a pasture setting with more insects? Yeah, you know, I had a, I had a graduate student who, um, who, who did a little bit of work on that, and um, I just thought this would be a world famous study that you know everyone would be really be wanting to you know to hear me talk and it just you know never really worked out that way <laughs> what what we did is I, I actually had him put these um, plexiglass tubes in fields and he actually vacuumed up all the insects and <laughs> and and then he he we had some really good information about um, the energetic demands of bobolinks and, and savanna sparrows. And he actually said he took this and he figured out how many calories are in this, you know, tiny little piece he vacuumed up. And he extrapolated that and found that bob you, you could have a hundred, or I guess not, it was like 10 times more bobolinks on this field um, given the amount of food that was out there. So they don't seem to be food limited. Even after you cut a field and take, you know, not just the, the hay, but the insects away as well, you actually have got more food than they need. So it seems like, I mean, that could actually be, you know, again, thinking about the, you know, basically the cool season grasses that we grow in Vermont, we just may be growing gorgeous bobolink habitat. I mean, it may be one of the reasons why these birds shifted their distribution. They may have been doing better in the east than they did in the Midwest with warm season grasses that take them longer to green up, maybe have more innate defenses against bugs, um, herbivorous bugs, leaf chewing bugs. I, you know, I don't know, but they're doing okay food wise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, right, yeah, yeah. So um, in essence, um, it's tough to be a grassland bird in a pasture. I mean, it's kind of what it boils down to. And, um, you know, not only, you know, is there sort of, there's trampling, and if you don't get trampled, you lose the cover around your nest, um, so you're more susceptible to predation. We've got pretty good evidence, but we've actually, um, from places in other parts of the country, there's really good video evidence that cows eat eggs and nestlings. So, um, so it's, it's, it's really hard. And so, I mean, basically, you know, decreasing stocking density, um, increasing the length of the rotation, or actually having some sort of a fallow paddock um, s system would be sort of the, you know, the best uh, approach. You know, it, a lot of times, um, you know, if if I had, you know, if I could, if I could sort of give all of all of the farmers in Vermont one of my undergraduate students for for the summer, where they could sort of go out and find bobolink nests, and farmers could mow around them, or here's the most productive paddock, and why don't you not graze in this one? It'd be great. But you know, I mean, farmers are tremendously busy. It's really hard to kind of do that sort of assessment out there. It's not. It's not that difficult, but it's time, it's time consuming. So um, we need, we need a, the intern program for, uh, for farmers would be great. Do you know if switchgrass is compatible? 
Yeah, so it's it's not it's not great, and and again, this is sort of one you know one of the things I'd love to do an experiment on is is thinking about warm and cool season grasses, and um, I think I think one of the reasons one of the things we we did this um, you know sort of this mathematical thing where we actually look to see um, what kind of management practices if you do these you know sort of on pencil and paper or computer would have the, the most benefit to the bobbling um, population. And basically what we found is the, the you know, less acreage in early, early hay fields, moving that to middle or late would have the most benefit. And I think the reason for that is that those early cut fields are the ones that you know, the, the farmers really value. I mean, they're the, they're the driest, they've got the best soils, they're the ones where they you know, are gonna put the manure. Um, and those are the ones that green up the quickest in the spring. And I think that's the cue for these birds to settle. Those, those fields that are really green, really lush when those birds show up. And so this, you know, sort of the switchgrass issue or the, you know, sort of the warm season grass issue is what are these birds actually queuing in on? And so I think the earlier the, a field greens up, um, the more likely you're gonna have birds settle there. Now, over time, I think, is where you potentially have those benefits. So um, over time, we know birds will kind of avoid those fields that are just cut early every year after year after year. We've actually seen densities go down. Um, and perhaps if you've got a switchgrass field that's you know, continually cut late over time and you get birds sort of honing in on those over the years, um, they, it, may, it may work, but I think it's not, it's not a sort of right off the bat, you plant it and they will come. It, it takes time for it to, to happen. No, um, males arrive first. Um, both bobolinks and savanna sparrows are, are polygynous, so one male will mate with more than one female. Um, I think it's actually probably worse on, on males than it is on females later in the season because I think a lot of those, you know, those, those fields that have, those, um, that have bobolinks on them, they, the males kind of lock up those territories and females can come in and breed with a breed with one of those already established males, but the males, they may not be able to actually get in and establish another territory. So I think the females actually maybe in terms of their, you know, passing their genes on, maybe do a little bit better. Do you think that the, the distance from the edge is a result of, of the risk of predation and that there's less nest success? Yeah, so um, <laughs> we think that's what the birds think, but there is no, there is, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the birds are wrong, unfortunately, yeah, so. <laughs> it's really, you know, there's something that's really interesting about that, though, and we, we actually, um, we published two papers sort of back to back that, you know, I, I'm thinking about the editor of this journal who, who we, had, we used essentially the same data set and reached one conclusion here and another <laughs> conclusion here. They're like, maybe he won't notice. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> but, but we had this guy from uh, uh, a graduate student actually from Tufts come out, and he had this really kind of interesting hypothesis that, you know, I think sort of plays into this, you know, sort of Midwest origin of, of bobolinks. And basically what he found is that the, the lower the vegetation on the edge of the field, the more, the closer the birds will nest to that edge. And he basically used this, what he called this kind of angle to the horizon. And so basically, you know, you could sort of think about walking the edge of a field and you can, you know, when it's, when it's low vegetation, you can walk closer. When it's tall vegetation, you have to get further away and you can actually sort of draw this jagged line around the edge of the field. And that really nicely mapped where the birds were. Um, I mean, the other study wasn't necessarily contradictory to that, but, you know, we're sort of looking at some other things. So in essence, we think it's probably due to predation, but the problem is it's kind of like this feudal strategy. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't do these birds any good. And I think one of the issues is actually that if you have a late cut field, 
um, most of the predation is actually due to things that are in the field already. And we think actually a lot of it is small mammals. So meadow voles actually are nest predators on these guys. Um, occasional snake, we think, sorry, sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, occasional, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, um, so, so, so that after a field gets cut, I think then it's kind of open season. I mean, we know, I mean, we're, you know, we're close to the Four Brothers um, nesting island, so we've got gulls all over the place. Um, but what the gulls don't get, we know fox and coyotes are getting. But I think, I, I, you know, I, one of the things that's really kind of interesting, especially when you put this in the context of biodiversity, is these are unique birds that are out in these grasslands, but they're not tremendously biodiverse. I mean, you've got bobolinks and savanna sparrows and then, you know, some metal large grasshopper sparrows, but it's, it's not like walking through Green Mountain National Forest and hearing the crazy diverse um, set of bird calls. So it's kind of a, a unique set of birds. And I, I think it's maybe not really worth it for a, you know, a fox to roam through a field. There just isn't that much to eat out there. I, you know, if they, if they ate the voles <laughs> or those darn snakes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, aside from the financial oh. Been reasonably responsive to the whole idea? Dismissed it as folks rubbish? Yeah, so um, it, it varies a little bit. And so, you know, the one, the one thing that we've grappled with, and it's, um, and some, somebody brought up the question already, oh, I, I think you did, is basically that um, what you know, sort of the gentleman farmer needs to um, to potentially cover the costs of brush hogging um, versus what a dairy farmer needs is is vastly different. And so one of the things we've s sort of thought about is so so a dairy farmer is to some degree disadvantaged in this because if we order these bids from low to high, um, those highest ones are, are the, it's the last thing we're going to be able to fund. Um, granted, if we're talking about, you know, dollar acres per dollar that's better for you know that's better for the folks who are um, you know who are pledging but it doesn't it doesn't really jump us into that how do we make this work for dairy farmers and that's been that's been their concern is they're saying I've got I've got more cost to cover from my land than you know somebody who's not necessarily trying to make a profit off of it how do you know how am I going to benefit and so We've been actually thinking about, you know, would it, would it make sense to actually have a couple tiers of this program? Would we have, you know, sort of a, a dairy farmer program and the, the sort of gentleman farmer program? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, yep. On this, the habitat and grass issue is a question, though, because if you have, like, like we have a gentleman farm, 112 acres. Mm -hmm. I look for bobolinks. I don't mm -hmm. see them. I've got a lot of weeds we cut at the end of the year. Yeah, yep. So what's mm -hmm. the point, though, if they're not going to come? And if you don't cut a lot, then you get more weeds. Yeah, right, so exactly. How do you get yeah. That grass, you yep. Know, in the first place, yeah. they want. Yep. So will they nest in it? Or yeah, not? do you do you remove your, do you just brush hog it? Or brush do you, hog. yeah. That's one of the things that I've sort of struggled with. And it goes back to your question about the switchgrass, because, you know, there's been conversations about, you know, about biofuels and are there, you know, are there ways to think about, um, actually producing some sort of a, you know, a fuel crop, so to speak. And um, one, of the, one of the issues, this gets back to the how quick these fields green up in the spring, is that if you just, just brush hog and you, you know, leave the, stu you know, the mulch out there, um, it takes longer for those fields to green up. And that essentially gives forbs an advantage over grasses, competitive advantage. And so that's, so, you know, one thing we actually have done on some fields, we've actually talked farmers into, into just, you know, you were just brush hogging it, what if you pick it up? And we've actually seen numbers of bobolinks increase in those situations. So um, they've just been, you know, a lot of these farmers are just using it for bedding or um, maybe, you know, selling it to somebody for... You have to have equipment to pick it up. Yeah, yep, exactly, right. Or, or you're going to pay someone. That's where yeah. your money would 
Right, yep, yep, <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, and then there are people that are willing to pay someone and can't find Yeah, to yes, do it. exactly, <laughs> right, exactly, yeah, 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 yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, I've got a I've got a, a woman in extension who is really fascinated in trying to do that. In particular, she is really interested in this idea of trying to train animals. I think she's really thinking about goats um, to actually eat invasives as well. And apparently, that's something that you can do: is you can actually train animals to eat particular types of plants. And so. You could actually think about this as, is there, is there sort of a rehabilitation program for some of these areas that have been colonized by, you know, by, you know, other Forbes? I don't know. She, she wants me to get involved in this. And <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess goats are next. So, yeah, yeah. But no, I think, I think that's, a, you know, that's potentially a really good idea. And, um, and, uh, you know, there's, there, there definitely are some, uh, you know, we, we actually have got some, you know, it's, it's rare, but there are some birds, mostly savannah sparrows that are still nesting in August. And, um, you know, it's, it's all sort of a matter of, you know, how sort of quick you move them on and off out of those areas. But, yeah, I think grazing has got potential. Um, and, and we obviously know grazing is increasing in popularity as well. So, yeah. 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 They'll they'll eat some seeds. Um, we uh, you know I've I've found um, what they eat most is actually dandelion seeds, um, which is sort of interesting. Yeah. Um, but there's there's a lot of dandelion out there. Um, yeah. So it's it's mostly leaf hoppers um, and caterpillars and Crickets, grasshoppers are kind of their big three food items that they feed their young. Yeah, yeah. Mostly for feeding their young, but what about oh, and as a, yeah, the adults, yeah. Are they the, uh, I I think some, but I, I think they are primarily feeding on insects as well. Yeah, yep, yep. Right. Yep. 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 Yeah. I exhausted you? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on, one more. <laughs> oh, go ahead, yeah. Is there, we uh, have a problem like all the way from Manchester to West Charleston on the Canadian. Mm, Is yeah. there a slide of the dates for nesting and pledging as you go from there? Uh, yeah, I think so. We just don't have really good data on that. So um, I, I, should, I should probably try to, you know, uh, um, you know as more and more... Um, breeding bird atlases or second breeding bird atlases become available, I should try to mine that data and see if I can get sort of the nesting phenology across their range down a little bit more. Um, we're actually supposed to be working on a revision of the nesting, uh, the, the bobolink uh, species account for North America. So maybe that's something we could actually put in there. So yeah, good question though. And it would be, it would be obviously nice to know that if you're thinking about this 65 day window, where do you want it yeah. to start? So, yeah, 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 yeah. You talked about, you said about mowing around the nest. Um, if you have a field that's, say, 15 acres and you have a nest site, how much acreage would you have to leave there to make, keep that nest? Yeah, so we have seen it with a, with a patch about the size of a Volkswagen bug. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not sure that might last forever on a field. Um, I'm thinking over time, predators might learn that the Volkswagen bug size patch of grass actually has, yes, exactly, right, yeah. So, um, but we actually had an undergrad student do a little experiment. Unfortunately, the sample size was sort of small, but we had a bunch of nests marked, and, um, and the farmer was all set to cut around them. But then it rained, and he couldn't get out there, and then the, the, the next fledged. So we got a few of them, and, um, and, and a couple of them survived. So, um, so, the, so you don't need much, um, but whether or not that would work three years in a row, I don't know. There's some smart foxes out there, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. It seemed like you would be able to maybe cut around the edge the whole time. It was a big field. For sure. Yeah. That. Yeah. And I'm yep. thinking about my neighbor right now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. No question about it. No question about it. Because that's where I mean, you're gonna have. Cut a strip along the swamp there. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. I how far you said they yeah. usually don't nest. Yeah. Fifty fifty yards probably. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We'll try that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Do you have any knowledge of how the bobolink got its name? Well, I, I mean, I think it's, uh, the idea is it's a mnemonic of the, the vocalization. So I should have brought, dang, somebody gave me a bobolink poem. I should have brought it today. But um, anyway, the, um, I guess send it to Ron. You can send it out to your, uh, send it out to the, the membership. But uh, yeah, some people say, it, it, I mean, if you put the bobolink song to words, which is essentially impossible, it's bobolink, bobolink, spink, spank, spink. <laughs> yeah, and you know that sounds nothing like a bobbling, so, yeah. <laughs> if you had a big field, then you said they need a half acre for their own territory. Right, yep. Does that mean that they would tend, there, if there were a several bobolinks around, they would tend to all go towards the middle? Right. They would, half, they would each have a half acre territory? Roughly, yeah. Yeah, I mean... It's it's a little it's a little odd with um, with bobolinks, you know. I I, I, um, I I tell I think I sort of tell this story to students sometimes. You know, there's a there was a um, cartoon, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was the um, it was the wolf and the sheepdog, and they would they would go to work. They'd have all you know their lunch stuff. They'd punch the clock, and then they'd go into the you know into the paddock, and they were mortal enemies. And at the end of the day, they'd walk home, you know, they'd punch out and walk <laughs> home together. Bobolinks are sort of like that, where you just see these incredible battles, you know, all over the field. And then they come down and it's like they decide to rest on the same, you know, line of fence or something like that. So uh, we, d we don't really fully understand bobolink territory dynamics. I think on the ground, they do actually have lines they sort of draw in the hay. I think in the air, it's kind of like anything goes, and there are these, you know, giant battles, and it's sort of neutral airspace up there. Um, but but it's uh, but it's we we don't really know exactly. But it seems like yes, they they do have a line, but only on the ground. And once you're up in the air, sort of all bets are off. So yeah. Have you tried any tried the 65-day gap with mob the mob grazing principle that they're doing, where they graze they graze down a paddock before. Right, yeah, yeah. Didn't graze it again. Right, yeah. Days. Yeah. We, we've got an NRCS program for it. I mean, we've got funding out there for it, but we don't, but, um, and yes, it should work, they absolutely. Mob, yeah, they, yeah. They rented our land and their mob. Okay, yeah, now, yeah. the grass now is coming in. Nice, yeah. It's greening up. Yeah. They kill, they take okay, off right, yeah, yeah. I just yep. yeah. Sheep yeah. Cows, sheep and cows together. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, th there's money in it for them. If you want to tell them to call their NRCS, um, you know, their biologist. So, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. Do they, do the bottlings return to the same fields year after year? If they're successful, yeah. So if they're not successful, unlikely that they're coming back, or especially if the field is cut. I mean, sometimes if the nest is depredated, um, they'll come back, but, but generally um, if they're successful, they'll stay. If they're unsuccessful, they'll just try somewhere else. Yeah, yep, yeah. We good, Ron? <laughs> okay, last one, yeah. What kind of habitat do meadow larks have? We didn't talk about that. Yeah, we didn't really, yeah, yeah. Some, uh, you know, one of the things that's odd about both bobolinks and meadowlarks is we, we say they like this grass, but they sing in trees, and, and meadowlarks, exact same thing. You know, top of a fence pole, you'll see a meadowlark singing. Meadowlarks are definitely more area sensitive than bobolinks. They like bigger patches. Um, they seem to actually be more of them where you've got some grazing. And I don't know if they actually like a little bit sort of, you know, sort of variation in grass height um, that may be something that's attractive to them. 
but but anyway, yeah. So um, grass again, bigger areas, maybe more you know, sort of heterogeneity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what gives you hope for the future? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that's that's really um, you know it, it's it's really great, and um, you know we've got some you know farmers in the audience here is. They're concerned, you know, and they, they know as they're going out and cutting their hay that they're cutting up birds. And it's like, this is, this is not really why I, you know, got into this industry. It's not why I did it. So they're, they're interested in innovations that can make this, you know, can make this work. And so I think it's, you know, it's really the farming community that gives me hope as much as anything. I mean, they're, they, they like to see the wildlife on the fields. Um, you know, turkeys, deer, you know, metalarks, bobolinks, you know, you, raptors, you name it. Um, and so I, I think that's, you know, that's kind of the bottom line is how do you make it work economically? It's a really, it's a fascinating challenge. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yep.